I hope he borrows a billion in USD from the World Bank, buys Bitcoin with it, and then pays the World Bank back in IOUs backed by the Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin pays for itself, and the World Bank gets wrecked, and El Salvador has a billion dollars of new Bitcoin. It's a disruptor, you know, and, and the internet has done this time and time okay. again, and now it's doing it to money. But I love the fact that the people, the, the main benefactors of the legacy system yeah. are going to be the, the, the last people to adopt Bitcoin. They mm -hmm. built themselves yeah. a cage and mm -hmm. they're going to sink in that cage. And they thought that cage was to protect them from the outside, but it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to end up being their downfall. So. Hey guys, how are you guys doing? Uh, this talk, which you're going to listen to, is a talk which you probably have been waiting for a long time. It not only elevates you know, your knowledge, your comprehension, but elevates really your spirit, gives you hope, and you know shows you the light at the end of the tunnel. So after El Salvador declared Bitcoin is legal tender, it has gone full-blown hyper-Bitcoinization, as we say, uh, more and more countries are are about to follow uh, smaller countries, mid-sized countries, eventually, you know, uh, larger countries, nation states. So I, have, I had the real pleasure and honor to sit down with Lord Fuzitua from Tonga, a member of the parliament, and Alessandro Cesare and Nico. Alessandro Cesare and Nico are both originally from Venezuela and uh, so we had a really deep down dive into the rabbit hole of bitcoin and you know did a reality check and uh, analyze the whole situation in totality so without further ado this is my talk with lord fuzitua alexander cesare and nico hope you can enjoy this i really had a blast sorry for the glitch in between i had a, a fallout in the internet connection even though i had like super bandwidth Anyway, hope you're going to enjoy this. Let me know your questions, your suggestions, and uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter and also my guests. I'm going to put those in the show notes. And thank you so much. Enjoy. Hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> good evening. Whatever time it is you're listening, you're watching this. Thanks so much for coming on my show. Uh, first of all, Lord Fizitua, uh, Alessandro Cesare, and Nico. Uh, it's I'm really excited. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, but I wanted to, uh, you know, start off maybe with a short introduction, Lord Fizutua. I'm really, I looked at your curriculum vitae as to speak. It's, it's I'm really uh, amazed at, because, you know, I, I mean, I also studied law, like I have a legal background, but I never went into the judicial, you know, classical judicial uh, route. So in connection with that, I want to talk to you about, you know, what do you think about the legitimacy of the um, International Monetary Fund and a lot of other topics. But um, why don't you tell tell me or tell our listeners what is your journey to Bitcoin and how, how did you? Because um, I to be honest with you, I'm going to be very fr uh, shamefully honest. Uh, I never heard. I heard sometimes about Tonga, but I had to really do some digging and research, bef you know, before our talk. Uh, and when I listened to one of your talks on Twitter Spaces. Uh, where you said you were on some, I don't know, in some um, some airport and the officials couldn't even find it on the map, <laughs> which is so ridiculous. Right. Yeah. So thank you so much again, all of you. And why don't you just kick it off? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the invitation, first of all, uh, and I'm glad and uh, privileged to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, I'm from Tonga, which is uh, a small uh, island kingdom in the South Pacific, uh, sort of northeast of Australia, New Zealand, uh, southwest of uh, Fiji and Samoa. Um, I serve as a uh, Lord Member of Parliament there. Uh, we uh, model our system on the UK, so instead of having a, a separate house of lords and house of commons we have it all in one unicameral house so 
There's nine of us uh, Lord members and 17 members uh, elected by universal suffrage from the general population. So as you said, uh, my background is is in law. Uh, I trained uh, as uh, a uh, uh, intellectual property and uh, corporations, uh, companies, uh, uh, business law, a bit of tax law, um, telecommunications law, and uh, but ended up uh, first practicing um, as a, a crown prosecutor, which meant uh, I had to get a, a good grounding in uh, criminal law um, and constitutional law initially uh, before going into the private sector. Uh, sorry, did did someone say something? No, no, go oh, ahead. Oh, no. Yep, sorry, I thought I heard a question. Um, yeah, so uh, went into the private sector and worked for a, a company uh, that uh, leased uh, satellite space to people who are uh, countries and companies uh, putting satellites in space uh, and eventually in private practice and then into into politics. Uh, so my journey with Bitcoin was uh, about 2013, uh, probably end of 2012, beginning of 2013. Uh, I had a relative of mine uh, contact me uh, from overseas. He's like a brother to me, and uh, what he's a little bit drunk one night, and he contacted me. Uh, we've I've always been into uh, IT, uh, computers, technology, and uh, he said, "Oh, there's this great uh, new um, cryptocurrency. It's called Bitcoin." And I think it's life changing. What I'll do is um, I'll get some for each of us. And next time I see you, uh, I'll show you how you can, I can give it to you. Uh, having no, no idea about uh, the technology, how it works or anything at the time, uh, I, was, I said, yeah, great, awesome. And by the time I got to see him uh, a little while later, uh, he was in Tonga, and I said, uh, yeah, uh, explain that uh, that thing to me that uh, you got us into. And he kind of explained a bit, and I said, oh, great. Well, how do I, do you give it to me in a coin, or what is it? How do you hand it over? Um, and he said, well, funny you mention that. I uh I actually, uh, the value went up a bit and uh, I sold it. I was a little bit drunk and <laughs> I've already sold them. So yeah, that was um, not much use to me. So about two or three years later, uh, anyone that uh, has any experience with the Caribbean, Central, South America, in the Pacific as well, uh, we have uh, a lot of American businessmen who, in inverted commas, the sort of uh, fly-by-night uh, uh, sort of yeah, um, shady paths. You don't really know where they're from. They come through with uh, big ideas and they get you to invest in uh, possible uh, get-rich-quick schemes and they usually abscond uh, with the money and you don't see them again. So uh, he explained to myself, uh, I'd already uh, heard of it, but a number of the other Lords uh, about Bitcoin and uh, we didn't really understand the technology all that well at the time. And again, his recommendation was that we give him some money and invest in it and he would get us some. And uh, we of course didn't understand how to get any ourselves at the time and he said, well, I'll get some for you and I'll hold it for you and, and uh, send it over. So we didn't, uh, we thought, yeah, great. Uh, we didn't know exactly how that would work. But again, uh, as just as previously, uh, he ended up 
absconding with all our, our investment money and was never to be seen again. And then uh, about two years ago, I got uh, seriously ill. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was um, uh, in Tonga. Uh, I collapsed and uh, was taken into hospital there. And uh, I, I think I, I clinically died at least once. Uh, they, we didn't have the facilities to treat me there. So they tried to get uh, an aircraft from uh, New Zealand, who's closest to us. They were unable to. Uh, and then I think they tried Sydney and were unsuccessful. And they found an air ambulance in, in Brisbane, in Australia. And that uh, flew to Tonga uh, urgently and medevaced me from Tonga to New Zealand, where uh, I died clinically again. <laughs> and they were, got life-saving surgery and uh, they were able to revive me, uh, thankfully. So uh, very fortunate and very blessed to, uh, to still be here. So I, was, I have a lot to thank those, those physicians for. Uh, but what that entailed was um, six months in hospital uh, in recovery. And in those six months, uh, without too much to do, uh, I uh, decided, <coughs> excuse me, I, my interest in Bitcoin was peaked again. And I decided to read uh, every word that had ever been printed about Bitcoin. Uh, listen to every word that had ever been uttered about it and watch every moving image that had ever been recorded about it uh, in a hospital bed uh, in six months and uh, was pretty much orange pilled. Uh, yeah, I saw in there in the ICU uh, for six months uh, and began uh, investing from my hospital bed right then. So, uh, yeah, I, I understood, I realized what um, this technology would mean uh, internationally, globally for um, the, the monetary and uh, economic systems for the general uh, populace. Uh, I was in a, a uh, first world country. So um, initially, those were the thoughts that struck me, your, your general um, uh, investors understanding of Bitcoin, which is to uh, dollar cost average regularly, and uh, ensure that you have enough to uh, by the dips when uh, and you understand the cycles of of the of the asset and uh, when uh, dips occur and ensure that you've got uh, your cascading buy set to take advantage of these dips but more than that after after that initial understanding a very uh, sort of zoomed in understanding uh, I zoomed out slightly and understood then that this could be a technology that would change, be completely life-changing for people in the developing world and in countries like mine, uh, people who have no idea about investment, who are uh, living hand-to-mouth. And uh, this technology, uh, uh, even without... Uh, owning the asset, just exposure to this network could change uh, the life of uh, billions, literally billions of people, uh, two thirds of, of the planet that uh, is in the developing world, uh, probably actually a little bit more than that. Their lives could be changed overnight by access to this uh, 
this very pristine and uh, asset, this sound money uh, in economic terms to someone who's an economist, uh, but uh, the, uh, the asset, uh, but the asset aside, just the network itself could be so life-changing. So, yeah, once that understanding dawned upon me uh, in hospital, then it, it uh, made me double down even more on the, the technology and its possibilities, uh, not just for myself, but for, for my country. And, yeah. uh, and it's staggering. The, I mean, the, it's really shocking. I mean, I learned so much from you, uh, Lord uh, Fuzitua. It, you, the, the numbers you mentioned uh, about remittances, I didn't even know that. I mean, was it like 700 billion a year or something like that? Can you read? That's right. That? The, the global remittance industry, uh, which is largely from the developing world, is 700 billion, well, 714 billion are the figures from the World Bank in 2019. So they've probably gone up by a factor of 5% or so. So yeah, it's at least 750 billion uh, in 2021. So, um, and that remittance industry is, is, is not too diversified. There's, there's pretty much uh, only a, hand, uh, a handful. You can count on one hand the, the avenues uh, that that remittance industry uh, follows. It's usually a company called Western Union or MoneyGram uh, in my country anyway, and uh, mobile telephony companies, uh, ironically, uh, they almost you know, they practically do. They give out free handsets uh, because they're seeking 100% penetration into the population because they make money from the credit top-ups on those handsets, yeah. But the money that's really there for the making is uh, the, an application layer they put in those handsets to be used as digital fiat uh, terminals so that you can uh, be in Los Angeles and log on to a website uh, with your credit card or your bank account details and you can send uh, automatically on the telephone company's website uh, $100 to your cousin in Tonga and it will appear on their mobile phone. And the companies have already rolled out point of service uh, hardware at, at the vendors, uh, the stores in Tonga, so that you can uh, cash out that digital fiat at a participating shop front or spend that fiat uh, directly for goods and services in the store. So those three avenues are the channel for uh, the 40.7%, the 40 uh, our annual GDP of our country is made up 40.7% of by remittances. <laughs> so that's nearly half, yeah, half our GDP yeah. uh, is constituted by remittances from overseas so uh that's uh that's that's life-changing uh if someone um uh exposes the country to the bitcoin network uh and to strike that means that instead of re receiving sorry I, I neglected to mention what Western Union MoneyGram and these telephone companies, digital fiat systems have in common is they take on average, uh, it's, it can be a little lower, it's usually a lot higher. Uh, on average, a 30% cut in fees for all remittances sent. So for $100. Yeah, if yeah, that means exploitation, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah, so for the $100 that's sent from Los Angeles or San Francisco, the person receives $70. So you either eat it on the sender's end or you eat it on the receiver's end. For you to receive 100, the sender will have to send 130. Uh, but usually the sender is 
uh, an unskilled Tongan who is a migrant and is working hard in a lower skilled job uh, for a few years, looking for a, a better life for their family, but send money back every week. And so the, the cost is eaten on the receiver's end. They get 70 instead of 100. So with the exposure to Bitcoin and the Lightning Network, uh, adding one app alone, just adding one app to those uh, mobile phones that are given out by the, uh, ironically, the mobile phone that the, the mobile, that the digital fiat is supposed to come to, just adding one app to that phone and one app to the point of sale means they can receive a hundred dollars instead of seventy dollars. Exactly. And and when yeah, they, overnight. I mean, when they become obsolete from one day to another, it's like you know Jeff Booth's example with Blockbuster. <laughs> you know, exactly. Obsolete, exactly. Like from one day to another. Uh, overnight, and, uh, Alexander. If you want to chime in, um, go ahead. Yeah, please. Sorry, I, I apologize for taking up all the. Uh, the... Uh, no, man, no worries. Actually, super excited to hear all of these things coming from you. I mean, like uh, I heard to your interview as well uh, on BDC sessions and the whole right. deals, uh, the whole IOU deal with El Salvador and how they could like basically uh, recalculate all of their Bitcoin holdings if they ever have Bitcoin holdings to pay back their debt. So no, so right. no script at all, man. I just, uh, I guess it, 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 um, I hear you talking about remittances and what comes to my mind, right? Being, uh, mm -hmm. being Venezuelan is that th this thing has, it, 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 I guess that it, it is now that we are seeing on social media, uh, Bitcoiners talk more about their remittances market and start seeing this dilemma that we have both an asset and a monetary network. And so I guess it just, if you were in Bitcoin four years ago and it probably Kivan and Nico can back this up, it was not cool if you were following cryptocurrencies in Latin America at all. Right. And, and out on all out of a sudden, it's like the coolest of things because, it, because right. it's, an excellent, it's an exemplary region. And we're like, we we are becoming yeah we're bec uh, becoming the Bitcoin capital continent like Bitcoin continent That's of, right. Absolutely. Of, of the globe in a sense, but what I can add right like based on my expertise guys and my own personal experience like my own Bitcoin rabbit hole right living in Venezuela and and, and having the Venezuelan lens of Bitcoin is that this is why peer to peer cryptocurrency markets will be so big because before we fully connect people as pure 100% peers to the network, decentralized peers, mm -hmm. it'll have to be via a mobile service, right? A website. And as of today, it's peer-to-peer -peer markets such as local Bitcoins and Binance peer-to-peer, -peer, the ones that are booming and that are providing the necessary rails to have on-ramps and off-ramps mm -hmm. Uh, uh, in the developing in, in developing countries, right? Uh, so, so I guess that it's it's, and we will expand more about this throughout the whole conversation on the episode. But I, I guess that we we will see this um, this important transition from pure one hundred percent decentralized technology uh, coming from the state in which we are right now that governments and entrepreneurs that are from each country should work the best way with uh, foreign uh, companies such as Strike in El Salvador, right? That's, an, that's a wonderful example. Uh, and that's a thing that has not happened at all uh, in Venezuela. Now, there are other implications as, as to why that is, but I guess that I can pass on the ball to Nico right now. <laughs> yeah, look, right. Uh, what happened in El Salvador was uh, the shot heard uh, around the world. Okay, it, it changed everything. Um, the fact that Bitcoin in 12 years became legal tender. This is a direct shot, you know, across the bow of central banking. Um, it, it has them scared crapless. And the reason for that is because their, their, their system and exactly what the Lord just mentioned, it's, it's exploitative by nature. 
right? So these are parasites. These are the the whole legacy system is not a system of inclusion, right? It's a system that works for about exactly. 40 percent of the world. But if you are in that sixty percent of the world, you are considered unbankable to use their own terms, right? So they've built this cage around themselves and they've made it so if you're if you're deemed worthy for example i'm venezuelan myself and i'm venezuelan american so i'm not like alessandro but if you're a venezuelan and you're coming to the united states and you want to open a bank account you can and that's exactly yeah. what bitcoin is for right those people those 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 uh those those undesirables those unbankables right uh that's exactly what bitcoin is for and just hearing, uh, you know, the Lord talking about uh, essentially the, the same story that I hear in so many other countries, all, you know, I, I can't help but just have a smile on my face and just see this hopeful future for countries that have been taken advantage of or disenfranchised even by the legacy system it's kind of like this cosmic justice because those are the countries that are going to be the first to adopt Bitcoin and therefore benefit the most from Bitcoin, right? So I'm very excited uh, to see what's going to happen. Um, there's, a, there's a part of me as well that is, uh, that is also bracing. I'm also bracing myself for uh, the 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 ramp up from the mainstream media, from the propaganda arm of you know of the financial establishment because they're going to go after Bitcoin hard because it's a direct threat to their power. Um, and as the World Bank and the IMF showed the other day, right, they could care less that Bitcoin and the Lightning Network is going to is going to save uh, El Salvadorians millions if not tens of millions of dollars every year if not billions of dollars in 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 reminiscence they don't care what they care about is maintaining that power right and uh that's why they released those two statements the other uh, uh about a week ago where they said we don't agree with this they need regulatory approval you know all that garbage all that bs you know so they pose yeah. as humanitarian you know yeah. financial institutions yeah. but they're not they could care less you know and Bitcoin is going to eat them for lunch, just like the internet has eaten everything else, right? Because if you guys all remember this, in the long distance market, you used to be have to place a call and you used to have to pay an arm and a leg. But the fact that we're all talking through Zoom right now completely for free, right? Like right. On, on different locations around the world, that's because of the internet. The internet hasn't come to money yet, right? We're still relying on this archaic system, right yes. where like these these paris the, these parasites take advantage of right whether it's the credit card companies that charge three percent whether it's the remittance companies that charge 30 percent right just to send money overseas and it's crazy because those people right those people that that pay those fees are the people that need the money the most and the people exactly. that the people that don't pay those fees are the people that have the money already so it's it's this this messed up skewed system but this orange meteor came out of nowhere and it's just going to completely yeah. disrupt the whole thing man and I'm just so hopeful for the future and after hearing what the lord had to say I'm even more hopeful it just yeah. made my day Can we do reality check uh, lord I want to have your opinion I mean what I mean besides the joy and pleasure I had when I heard when you know when we experienced you know Jack Muller you know giving this talk I mean it's just so totally out of yeah. where like what would what was your internal like reality check because i was like okay what's going to happen now? are they going to like i don't know what you know i mean uh, trigger a false flag attack or you know assassinate somebody or i mean what is like what was the worst case scenario that you had in mind you know i don't want to go into negativity but i just want to have yeah. sort of an objective uh, uh, reality check over here uh well to be honest i was <clears throat> excuse me so positively impacted by Jack's uh, speech at Miami and uh, uh, what was achieved there, that at the time I didn't um, didn't think about the negatives, but uh, you have to remember that uh, those of us, I'm sure the, the our Venezuelan brothers 
have a similar experience. Uh, in Tonga, we're barely recovering from the, the IMF and World Bank loans of the 1990s and 2000s. So what they do is they loan you money and then they force you to adopt austerity measures that make it impossible for you to repay. Uh, so they tell you, you have to cut spending in social services. Uh, your government has to be restructured uh, to prioritize particular areas of uh, regulation. And um, we, we ended up having the first uh, and only rights we've ever had in our country. It, it's a, it's a Pacific island that's pretty laid back. So that was anathema to our, our social order. In, in response to these austerity measures, uh, the government had to cut public service uh, wages uh, a lot. And uh, the public servants uh, responded in protest. Uh, and those were austerity measures directly imposed by the IMF and the World Bank. And the IMF and the World Bank, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they've long been um, the, the tools of um, the fiat central banking system in that uh, they uh, ensnare the developing world and keep them mired as primary industry, either plantations or mines to serve the first world with primary raw goods, raw materials, which the developed world then turns into manufactured goods and sells back at a profit to countries that the World Bank and IMF through these austerity measures, make sure that their own secondary and tertiary industries do not develop uh, because their government's spending uh, is reprioritized to focus on these primary industries. And they therefore become dependent on the developed nations for those imports. They don't have any manufacturing base of their own. So they import everything, processed uh, foods are imported, manufactured goods are imported, which means you have a, 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 a balance of trade, a trade deficit, which ends up being a, a deficit cycle that is ongoing and reinforced and re-entrenched by the World Bank and the IMF over and over again. And this has been happening uh, since Bretton Woods. Uh, the IMF is originally, uh, like the UN, it's the World War II's winners club. And they structured international uh, finance and the flow of international trade to ensure that it benefited uh, that World War II Winners Club and the, the developed world. And so the, what happened in El Salvador um, is karmic justice uh, to so many of us in the developing world. The fact that uh, uh, Christiane Lagarde uh, and the IMF her crew and the World Bank are scrambling now Mm -hmm. because with an independent monetary system that bypasses the fiat central banking uh, setup that has been, uh, what well, really, it began being built in 1450 when the first world reserve currency was established with the Portuguese uh, currency and went through uh, the Spanish currency, the Netherlands, uh, the, the British pound, each of them surviving 80 to 130 years until the USD, which is on year 77 of its, its hegemony. Uh, and the past couple of centuries, uh, the central banking system, uh, which is run by uh, not elected officials, but people from a particular group uh, who have for generations done this job and have re-entrenched their position in, in uh, global economics to ensure uh, that uh, state actors, act, entire nation states act on their behalf uh, to ensure uh, the, the, um, their, their influence and uh, 
their impact both within the developed uh, countries in which they are based, uh, as well as in their plantation and their uh, extraction industry mine, which is what they use the rest of the world for. So when uh, Bukele, uh, President Bukele decided to adopt uh, Bitcoin as legal tender, uh, he's effectively telling them that uh, we don't recognize your primacy anymore and the poorest people of our country will be exposed to a network that will immediately give them uh, Jack Mallow's interview with Peter McCormack. Jack said that in El Salvador, the fees are upwards of 50%. So that will give them 50% more value in their pocket. And therefore, they're spending 50% more value into the nation's economy. And therefore, the entire economy gets boosted, uh, including the state, by 50%, uh, by just being exposed to the rails. And uh, in Tonga, in El Salvador, in Mexico, who's the third largest recipient of our uh, of remittances on the planet at 36 billion per annum, uh, I've had testimonials from uh, Mexicans who say, we've been paying Western Union fees for four generations. Mm. Our great grandfathers have been paying this 30% and uh, the people who are sending the money can't really afford it. The people who are receiving the money are hand to mouth. So it's scraping value from those least able uh, to uh, to provide for themselves. And uh, even before Bitcoin, the net, the asset, just exposure to Bitcoin, the network, and the thousand cash points that Jack Mallers and Strike have in El Salvador and through Central America means that uh, uh, an El Salvadorian can receive the money that was sent from uh, the sister housekeeper in New York, the full $100, not take the four hour bus ride to Western Union that cost money both ways, not be uh, held up by the gangs at Western Union who, who uh, to take a tax of their own. Uh, and she ends up after the 30% to Western Union, the 20% to the gangs and the 10% it costs either way to go by bus, she ends up with 50%. Now, now her phone gets zapped and she gets 100% and just has to go to a cash point and show that QR code and they'll give her 100 USD. So she has no knowledge of Bitcoin. She does not realize she's been exposed to the rails. All she knows is 100 fiat was sent, 100 fiat was received. And that's life changing. Absolutely. And the beauty of it is that after a while, she'll re realize, I used to get by on 70. It's hand to mouth, but I got by. So maybe once every second week, I'll put that 30 aside as savings. And for the first time, people who live hand to mouth have the chance at savings. And maybe... She's not going to save it as fiat, maybe, mm. which the strike app and Jack's rollout, that particular rollout in El Salvador has the capability of doing, maybe she'll stack that $30 as sats. Exactly. And in stacking it as sats, you're, she's being exposed to Bitcoin, the asset. And in stacking sats, someone who for generations was hand to mouth suddenly has the opportunity to build generational wealth. Now that's a massive paradigm change. And not to mention the second, third order effects, like economically, technologically, exactly. relationship. I mean, amazing. So, so far ranging. And the picks and shovels uh, effects, the ancillary industries, uh, it, it's, it's a no brainer. It's booming everywhere. So um, yeah, it is, uh, and like I said, it's it's funny. Any way you flip it, this orange meteor works. 
So in the West, it goes, all right, it's metamorphosized over the years. It's evolved into a store of value. It's the most pristine store of value ever. Um, it's As Sailor says, it's better at being fiat than fiat. It's better at being gold than gold. It holds its value over time and space. Uh, over space, you can send it to the other end of the world, boom, uh, a few minutes, it's there. And in full value, what was sent is what was received. And if you're lucky, the price mine might have gone up and you received more than what was actually sent. And it holds its value across time because you bury it tonight and uh, dig it up five years later at the 200% per annum at which it appreciates uh, regularly uh, has been the average over the past 12 years. It's going to be 1,000% increased in value in five years. So this, uh, this uh, orange meteor, uh, which uh, has impacted us all, it works, it works both ways. So as a store of value in the West, it eventually became, is becoming a medium of exchange as it's accepted in uh, various places. Uh, uh, it's accepted in uh, Venezuela, it's accepted in Nigeria. Uh, but then you go to El Salvador and it begins as a medium of exchange. Mm -hmm and then turns into a store of value because it immediately their exposure is to its medium of exchange properties and they can cash out into fiat in it. And then eventually when they're able to, uh, to make savings and to stack some of that, then it will become a store of value. So either way, Bitcoin is flipped. Uh, the beauty of the technology is it's life changing either way. Alessandro, you want to say something? Sorry. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. I mean, after the El Salvador boom, I started like uh, trying to dig up some economic num uh, numbers from the nation. And I found it's just like general stuff. Like they have like $27 billion in debt uh, as of today, uh, $29 billion more or less, I think. Their GDP is $27 billion, but their foreign reserves are like $2.9 billion currently. So if El Salvador's president and the National Assembly went all Michael Saylor micro strategy on Bitcoin, they could have they could have bought approximately like more than a hundred thousand BTC uh, 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 this uh. Price, uh, at this dip's price. So if in ten years Bitcoin becomes a ten trillion plus monetary network, which will do so, uh, they could literally ten x their foreign reserves for from current right. or even more, and then eventually pay off their debt just by holding Bitcoin. And so, so well, that's that's the great thing. I mean, yeah. the, the the Forbes article, which I'm sure we all saw, which um, shows that uh, I think it's section 12 of article five, uh, that the World Bank, um, the World Bank's charter defines uh, currency in a particular way. And that the fact that um, El Salvador has adopted Bitcoin as legal tender uh, means that the World Bank will have, have to accept repayments to its loans in Bitcoin. And not just Bitcoin, the section says uh, all IOUs and fiat backed by that asset. So they could pay back in. El Salvadorian uh, uh, or USD fiat or um, IOUs backed by the Bitcoin. So they don't actually have to part with the Bitcoin themselves. They can stack it and pay off with the IOUs. And then uh, section, I think it's section nine of part of article two says that uh, if the backing asset changes in value and goes up, then the World Bank has to pay back mm -hmm. those gains to the borrowing country. Uh, they can't keep the gains. So someone was saying, um, man, uh, President Bukele's action was super bullish. And I said, no, do you know what will be bullish? And they went, all right. I said, when in the World Bank? I hope he borrows a billion in USD from the World Bank, 
buys Bitcoin with it and then pays the World Bank back in IOUs backed by the Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin pays for itself and the World Bank gets wrecked and El Salvador has a billion dollars of new Bitcoin. So, yeah, that's that was a slightly tongue-in-cheek, but that is entirely possible under uh, the the current uh, status of the, the uh, World Bank Charter. And what's fascinating is that these are the choices for the World Bank. They accept Bitcoin as payment, which means every nation can pay back their debts purely on the gains of possessing Bitcoin or the World Bank, which many have said may occur, does one of two things. They reinterpret the charter to say it's not, uh, Bitcoin is not money. Mm -hmm. It's not legal tenant, it's not currency. Therefore, we're not going to accept it. But if they do that, then they establish an international precedent that Bitcoin is not money. And the second they do that, that means that no uh, exchange has the right to KYC AML me anymore because the majority of my international parliamentary work I do is in anti-corruption. I work with the UN ODC, the United Nations Organization on Drugs and Crime. So we track uh, illicit financial flows uh, that go through the Pacific, through my country, through the world, uh, together with NATO. So money that goes to ISIS, the reason for KYC AML is we need to know exactly where the money comes from and exactly where it's going, because that's how ISIS gets, gets funded. Uh, so the second the World Bank says um, Bitcoin is not money, then there is no longer any legal grounds to KYC AML you anymore. They, they, and they, they can't, they can't. That, they're, they're, they're stuck right now. They're stuck. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place like that. that that's we've, what, gained, that's, we've gamed out the, the, the results. So it also raises the issue that in the United States and everywhere else, Bitcoin is regulated as two different things same time so for the purposes of exchanges and law enforcement we we treat bitcoin as a money or a currency which is why you have to kyc aml it but for the purposes of taxation it's treated as an asset that's why you pay capital gains tax there's never ever been a property in the history of legal jurisprudence that's treated as two different things right. Right. same time and that's that that deserves a test case all the way to the u.s supreme court and there's a bitcoin in germany who's a dev and this year he's going to fill his tax returns with bitcoin as a foreign currency he's not going to count it as an asset and he's going to only uh state that he's going to pay tax on speculation and on cashing out because that's all you pay tax for on foreign currencies and if the government doesn't accept it then he's going to sue them and there will be an international precedent for how bitcoin is regulated um it's the whole reason why we have the legal uh, pre uh, principle of double jeopardy once you're tried and uh acquitted of murder even if they've got film of you committing the murder, you can't be tried again. It's illegal to try someone twice for the same uh, the same action, the same offence. And the same principle applies to property law that you can't treat a piece of property as two different things at once. Uh, so, yeah, that means the World Bank and the IMF, that's the, the Andorra's box they open. If they don't recognise um, El Salvador's payments as money. So either way, it's a win for Bitcoiners. I, I absolutely agree. I think I think that uh, I think that it, it's a poison pill. I keep I keep saying that on mm. on, on our show. Um, and you know they they're stuck. 
because it's exactly what you said. If they do, you know, declare it as 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 a currency, you know, the floodgates open. Then you don't have to pay capital gains yeah. on that, right? You're excluded right. from capital gains tax, right? So then, then it's like then then what stops people from just hoarding Bitcoin? And then you know, so it it, it, it it's a disruptor, you know. And and the internet has done this time and time right. again, and now it's doing it to money. But I love the fact that the people, the, the main benefactors of the legacy system yeah. are going to be the, the, the last people to adopt Bitcoin. They mm -hmm. built themselves yes. a cage and mm -hmm. they're going to sink in that cage. And they thought that cage was to protect them from the outside, but it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to end up being their downfall. So it's, 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 it's Very awesome. Quick. It's karma. It is. It's karmic justice. Uh, and that's, I, it's obvious to all of us, but the audience, be good for them to understand the reason that developing nations like ours are, are perfectly suited to adopting Bitcoin is that we don't have a centuries old central banking fiat system uh, like the United States and Europe does. Uh, our, our central banks are newer. They're probably one or two or maybe three generations old, but not centuries old and entrenched like the, the US and Europe. So it, it finally pays off to be small and poor. Uh, Bitcoin turns those into virtues. Hell yes. Yes, man. That's uh, it, it makes me. Uh, man, it, it, so so much so much good news. And what's crazy about this is that this is an international phenomenon, and it's happening yeah. all at once. And it's all organic. There there is no council right. or you know or or whatever unelected yeah. bureaucrat officials that have a that have an agenda that is you know essentially saying what 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 can happen what can't happen it's all happening organically naturally and that's because yeah it's good to go from my end yeah Okay. Yeah, I'm just waiting for yeah, oh, there it is for Nico. Right. Yeah. Just want to say guys, this is why Bitcoin will probably never quit being so fun, right? Like right. like yeah. dude, like let's let's be realistic right now for a second. Like apart from the whole Bitcoin intellectual cocktail that we've already established, like mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a dude from Venezuela in the middle of a pandemic that is now living in EU. Nico is from Venezuela, he lives in the US, but it's because of this collective uh cloud of knowledge that we've built right. over the internet that we are connected and some like and somehow feeling next to each other, right? Uh right. So it's that I've said this before on Kivan's show and other Bitcoin pots. Like this is just like we can take it all the way up to a trillion dollar asset class, saving seven hundred billion dollars in remittances and whatever. But in the end, we're just doing something peaceful, right? We are just right. sharing. We are just sharing knowledge and love over the internet, man. And so that's, right. that's why this is unstoppable, man. That's why this. That's is right. Right. It's, it's freedom, because man. It's freedom. Despite, it's free man. Yeah, man, absolutely. Despite having a military industrial complex, which, as I said on Ben's show, is built for no other reason than to kill human beings who, who get in the way of that central bank and fiat system. Yeah, despite dude. having that, this peaceful revolution will prevail. It's inevitable. Like, like the, uh, I'm going to show what a nerd I am. Like the Star Trek uh, characters, the Borg uh, say, resistance is futile. 
uh, Bitcoin will prevail. Uh, and yeah, this peaceful revolution uh, is is not going to be derailed. It, totally, it's 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 inevitable, and um, the the idea is out of the bottle, and you can't put it back in, right? And you can't kill an idea. And what Bitcoin is, it's an idea, right? It's an idea of of self custody. Um, it's an idea of sovereignty. Right. And um, and exactly what the Lord was was talking about uh, earlier, whether you realize it or not, you know, you 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 will benefit from the Bitcoin network versus using the legacy system, which is designed in such a way where it literally only benefits the people at the top. That's literally how it's designed. Um and you know you have bitcoin just coming out of left field and completely disrupting that and uh and and giving a chance right because it, it's not skewing it to the little guy okay but what it's doing is it's creating an even playing field with the goddamn elites and which they've never given to anyone you see this in the united states as well this doesn't also this doesn't um this isn't only foreign countries you see it with amc amc stock you see it with the gamestop stock as soon as the little guys as soon as the plebs like we like to call ourselves you know started winning right guess what happened they just stopped the trading you know with bitcoin they can't do that no matter who they, they talk to and they're like the U.S. government, hey, hey, do something about it. You can't. It's decentralized, right? Yeah. So it's it's beautiful, man. It's 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 yeah. beautiful. And, you know, within a bigger picture or context, um, you know, I've always been trying to resolve for myself the question, how can, uh, you know, I mean, it's so mon monstrous, this, uh, as you call it, you know, military industrial intelligence central banking complex. Uh, how can it be that such a structure, such a gigantic structure, but still so elitism, you know, can be, how does it derive its legitimacy, uh, Lord? <laughs> I mean, with yeah. all this criminal sure. immunity, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Uh, yeah. The dollar. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you know, over centuries, they've centralized themselves using their ability to control the dollar 100%. Um, and there are, uh, without going into the usual conspiracy theories, there are, there are, there are groups of people uh, whose interests, particularly financial interests, uh, are vested in this monetary system. And they're not too fussed about which political party is in, in office. Uh, they, uh, they, will, they will fund both sides uh, to ensure that their primacy and the primacy of, of, of the central banking system uh, is is kept is kept safe. That's why uh, the central banking system has always been a slight outlier. It's of in inverted commas. It's of the state, but not quite of the state. It's not uh, directly controlled by whichever political party is in office. Uh, it decides uh how much the dollar that you work 60 to 80 hours a week is worth they decide how much your time is worth they they oscillate that price up and down arbitrarily uh, at how much your time is worth and the supply of this paper uh which carries the value of your time is is determined arbitrarily uh if uh when it suits um they'll print uh, 1.9 trillion pieces of paper that are backed by no extra goods and services, no uh, new product development that's going to benefit mankind. It's backed by thin air. And that thin air is distributed uh, to a nation suffering under a pandemic that doesn't realise that this thin air from uh, this central banking system is keeping them uh, in servitude <laughs> Uh, to this institution when um, access to this decentralized monetary network that has no CEO, no board, uh, is protected by uh, a global network of, as Michael Saylor likes to say, hornets, uh, 
who guard it uh, jealously and protect it with their lives, um, uh, who are willing, as Jack Mallis said in his speeches, uh, who are willing to die on that hill to protect uh, this network which gives other people freedom uh, Absolutely. from that, that structure. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll even add to that, you know, like it, it just look, the, the legacy system is a proof of stake system. OK, that, that's that's the way that's the that's the way it's it the is. Original proof of stake system. It, it's a proof of stake system. And what I think that one of the the best uh, it's Satoshi's creation, one of the geniuses, right, is the demo, uh, the the total democratization of the money creation, meaning you could be. The United States government, you could be someone, you know, someone living in, in Venezuela, you could be someone living in Argentina. You still have to pay 100%. the same yeah. amount of electricity as everybody else to get that one Bitcoin. And just that mere fact, just that technology in itself, what it does is it takes the human element out of the equation because over time, even with the best intentions, right? A system gets corrupted, right? But when the monetary policy can't get corrupted by humans, no matter which, you know, which party's in control, which ideology is popular at the time, right? You're taking the monetary policy out of the control of humans and you're giving it to math. Because I could tell you the monetary policy of Bitcoin for the next 147 years. I could tell it to you right now. I can't tell you the, 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 the monetary policy of the Fed for the next six months. I have no idea. In fact, I would even add to that. They have no idea what they're doing at this point. <laughs> they're just praying pretend yeah. so that the whole house of cards doesn't collapse on itself. Because this idea that they right. could raise rates if they wanted to, that's bullshit. This idea that they, uh, I apologize for cursing. This idea that, you know, that they could, uh, they could stop printing at the rate they're printing, that's BS as well. Right. So it's all facade. It's a facade. Right. And again, like the, the, the main benefactors are these bureaucrats at the top and of course the financial elites and this money printer and this system of proof of stake is what has allowed for so many wars to happen where the majority of the population didn't even agree with it. But the fact that the, the government had access to this unlimited money printer allowed them to fund whatever failed policies that they could think of you know so it's just it's just total bs bs yeah. and it amplifies um the impact that bitcoin will have and the beauty of uh, the bitcoin monetary policy is exactly as you said uh finally the the most um what has always been the point of failure for uh, monetary systems, which is human control. Uh, we've always been the point of failure. So you remove those that, uh, that point of failure and math is, uh, it, it, math is completely neutral. It has no agenda. It just uh, churns out uh, uh, an answer to a problem in the street and that's it. And to have a monetary system uh, based on proof of work, when our in practically the entire modern history of the developed world is based on the OG per, per proof of stake system, it's entirely a proof of stake system. And uh, its inability to cater to the entire, the entirety of a population is shown over and over and over again. And the adage that you measure a society by how its ability and how it treats its, its weakest and its most disadvantaged. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not a good track record that this proof of stake uh, system has with treating uh, the weakest and least and most disadvantaged. And Bitcoin treats them with great respect and uh, democratizes it. So they have exactly the same chance as someone whose uh, old money uh, 
lives in the Hamptons. Yeah, you st- your your Bitcoin is still only there will still only be twenty one million Bitcoin to you as there are to me, and after the halving, the 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 mining output is still going to be exactly the same as it is for you as it is for me, and as as you said, uh, when you plug in and get that hundred and ten volts. It costs the same as it does for you as it does for me. So, um, yeah, that's the beauty of uh, one of the beauties of Bitcoin and uh, its ability. As I said uh, earlier, without even getting into uh, the asset, the most pristine asset and the most sound money that has ever been created, without even owning it, just being exposed to that network is life changing. So yeah, it's it's exciting times. Um, Lord Fuzita, would you say time is of the essence? I mean, if you were to advise or give an advice to not only you know the President Bukele of El Salvador but other Latin American countries, do you think it doesn't matter anymore the process of whatever you want to call it, hyper Bitcoinization, or do you think this is the time? You know the momentum we need to seize or the people of all these different countries small mid-sized large sides and you know do the same thing that el salvador had just initiated i mean is that is time of the essence now or or i'm of the essence because we still live in a real world and we still live in a world where the imf and the world bank are the dogs of war of of this financial system they're the they're the, the front line um, that this centralized uh, central bank fiat system sends out around the globe uh, to do its bidding. And those who benefit uh, from this central banking financial system, uh, history has shown that they don't sit on their hands uh, when, they're, when they are threatened and when their primacy is threatened. So I think time is of the essence uh, in order that we get as many of us um, on the other side of the ledger as possible uh, in the strength in numbers, right? So in preparation for that onslaught, it's harder to uh, in reinterpret, uh, to illegally reinterpret the World Bank Charter against a dozen nations instead of one. So we are all we all have World Bank loans and we're all repaying World Bank loans. And it's harder for that absentee landlord uh, to uh, hold up his case against an entire building of tenants who are complaining mm. uh, rather than just one uh, one apartment uh, who's saying, no, I'm not going to stand for this anymore. If the entire building is going, look, uh, either you change your payment system or we're going to leave or we're going to torch this building. Um, it's, yeah, I think time is of the essence. And from the nation state side, I can guarantee you this is the first time you're going to see FOMOing by nation states. Absolutely. Uh, no one's going to want to be the last to take advantage of this. No head of government is going to want his population to go everywhere else in the world they've doubled their gdp why haven't we you're getting voted out of office so yeah no uh, government in the developing world wants to be the last uh, to get on this uh, uh, yeah this perfect technology so do you think we're going to experience an unexpected acceleration of this process or do you think it's going to take i think so Okay. I think so. I think uh, it may go in oscillations, like in waves, but I think we're at the beginning of the crest of, of this first wave where there will be an acceleration, I think, of at least half a dozen Central and South American countries. Um, the president of Tanzania last week uh, informed her uh the central bank to prepare to take on Bitcoin as, as legal tender. So the African continent, once the African continent is sparked, that will spread like wildfire. There's us in the Pacific. So it's not any one region. It is now globe, a global 
uh, movement. And as you said, uh, and as these uh, two astute gentlemen have alluded to earlier, uh, those who most need it have been the ones who've been had least access to it. And conversely, those nations who are, are most developed, it looks like they will be uh, the stragglers at the end, the last ones to adopt it because they've got uh, vested interests in their country uh, who will be fighting adoption. Oh, man. The, <laughs> epic, the epic battle for freedom on a global scale. Absolutely glorious to watch. And uh, But, yeah, I, I agree with the Lord's point. I think that, unfortunately... Um, the you know the IMF, the World Bank, all all these financial elites, they own the mainstream media, right? So that's um, right. Expect propaganda. Expect you know the narrative. You know, at first it was it was used for 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 uh, you know they're gonna say terrorism. They're gonna say every single thing that you can imagine. Um, yeah. To kind of scare their citizens. And unfortunately, a lot of their citizens, especially in the Western countries, not so much, not so much in in sixty percent of the world, but in the in the forty percent privileged part of the world, unfortunately, a lar a large part of that population is going to pick the convenience of central bank digital currencies. They're going to do it because they're going to be easier. Um, and you know that that's that that's going to be really interesting. Because I know that in in uh, sixty percent of the world that's excluded from the from uh, the legacy system, I, I I think they're gonna pick Bitcoin. They're not gonna want uh, a central bank digital currency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so yeah, man. So it, it's 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 exactly what we've been saying. It's cosmic justice. You know, it's it's yeah. uh, these countries that have been and and I didn't even Lord, I didn't know it was as bad as you say. Okay, we've been reporting and I've been doing yeah. research on the World Bank, but but man, it just proves what 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 our thoughts were. It, these people are enslaving countries with these pre uh, yeah. predatory loans, right? They give them to you, and then you're like you're in servitude, right? And then yeah. Bitcoin is a way out of that. Like it's literally 100%. a way out of that. In fact, you could use the loan that they give you to buy Bitcoin. To buy literally Bitcoin. Literally defeating exactly. them in the process. It's like it's like you're <laughs> using their garbage money to destroy them in the process. But exactly. It's, oh my God. It's it's gonna be great. And and I agree with you. I think this is gonna happen very quickly. I, I would say over yeah. Is it the FOMO is going to be real? You know, once they yeah. start seeing yeah. El Salvador, it's the calm before really the well, storm. You can exactly. feel it. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. feel if it. You, you if you think, it. if you think individuals can FOMO, wait till we see a whole nation state FOMO. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. it's going to be major FOMO. It's going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be great. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. And. Um, yeah, it's the fact that it's spread throughout the planet, uh, I think, is testament to the fact that uh, the way the World Bank and the IMF have been. And at the beginning, we'd think, uh, well, maybe this is just the natural um, uh, sort of development of having these types of loans. To, it's the natural way that things turn out is that you'll end up in a debt cycle until uh, uh, with modern technology, uh, Freedom of Information Acts and social media who digs out these things, uh, we find out that since the 80s, it has been policy. It's a documented policy uh, that they deliberately go out to ensnare developing nations in a debt cycle. Uh, that was directed uh, from management. That's the that's company policy and that's when you see how sinister it's been mm -hmm. and why this is such uh karmic justice uh that this is occurring yeah i mean as eric varsquill uh, you know often said i think the honeymoon phase is over i think we can agree on that <laughs> bitcoin's honeymoon phase is right. over now it's getting really right. exciting and um uh, Lord, before I forget, you you posted something on on Twitter. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not, not on Twitter, on Instagram. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, out of necessity, you know, I think people are going to become creative and Tonga might not have volcanoes, but they do have oceanic oh. waves. And, you know, you, you described how this could work, a potential response to Bitcoin mining energy FUD uh, using the kinetic energy of the waves around Neo Fou, I think pronounce it correctly, to generate electricity. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so once uh, my plan had become public of my hope, to uh, propel our nation into uh, Bitcoin adoption and thereby free our population of, uh, firstly, uh, the remittance fees uh, industry and the, the high level of fees that they impose on us and then expose uh, our country to the asset. Uh, I had not, that was the extent of my plan. I had I've also uh, intend uh, to push for our our National Reserve Bank, who is our central bank. Uh, they sit on 700 million USD in foreign reserves. And as anyone who has anything to do with a developing nation knows, uh, that's how developing nations measure their, their economic development, is how much do you have in foreign currency reserves because that reflects how much you have in exports and you're hoping that your exports are close to, if not more than your imports. It, it never is in a developing country, but you're hoping for a trade surplus rather than a trade deficit, which uh, only occurs because developing nation central bankers tend to be um, London School of Economics, Keynesian economists, mm -hmm. and that's what they push for, but that is never going to happen. So with that 700 million, they are faced uh, essentially with the decision Michael Saylor was faced with. Uh, do they hold it in USD? That's melting at 5% per annum. Do they buy bonds, which are a negative yielding at minus 2% per annum? Do they put it in gold that's inflating at 2 to 4% per annum? Or do they take the very objective, dispassionate, and logical step and invest it in an asset that appreciates at a, a rate of 200 percent per annum as it has over the past 12 years so that was the final step uh and i had not contemplated anything further but upon that becoming public i suddenly became approached by a number of uh energy and energy mining firms about doing mining in Tonga. If Tonga was going to be a Bitcoin country, their advice was that it only made sense, as in El Salvador, uh, to make it a mining country also. So Niwa for All is, is the island that my estate is. So uh, that land has been uh, in my, uh, my family, the person who holds who has held the title I've had now, I hold now. I'm the 20th Lord Fustua. Uh, those previously held it by me go back 1,300 years. And this wow. land's been in, in uh, my family for 1,300 years. So wow. it is the only populated volcano uh, in our country. We have 21 uh, volcanoes, 20 of which are unpopulated. Many of them... Uh, about the size of uh, a football field. Uh, ours, ours is an actual island. And I've been approached by geothermal energy firms about extracting geothermal energy and to do Bitcoin mining. Um, I had not known that a dormant volcano could produce <laughs> geothermal energy, but apparently, according to them, it does. So um, I'm very thankful and appreciative of these approaches. It's very generous of them, especially the ones who offer their technology for free just because they want to see a little 100,000 population uh, country uh, become a Bitcoin country and they want to see a little Bitcoin country succeed. So I've been overwhelmed by the generosity of these offers. Um, some of them are newer companies and uh, are still building. So they're offering 
the technology for free because uh, we'll be a pilot model for them that they can show other countries and thereby it, we're, we're an advertisement for them. Uh, but both offers uh, are equally generous. And the other form of uh, technology is the, the wave harnessing technology. So uh, the base unit uh, is underwater and then the float and uh, the floating unit is uh, just above it. And uh, the spar, which connects it to a heavy plate, uh, is underwater. And this unit uh, has a, a magnetic coil in it. And the movement, the kinetic energy produced by the movement of very strong, uh, very choppy seas generates a magnetic field around that coil. And when you break that mag magnetic field, uh, an alternating current is produced. So within the, the floater, uh, which houses the coil, that kinetic energy will create the magnetic field around the coil. And then the equipment uh, severs the, the magnetic coil and shoots an alternating current into uh, an amplifier transformer which captures it, uh, amplifies uh, the voltage and sends it down to a base unit uh, which shoots it to shore via cables which are designed uh, to minimise the loss of voltage and it hits a transformer on shore, a step-down transformer which brings it down to 110 or 240 volts depending on uh, what kind of machinery you're using from which part of the world and that uh, powers the mines. So just the movement of our seas and my island is is on the uh, is just above the Tonga Trench. So we are on the tectonic plate um, that is right at the precipice of there we are. That's that's the floater unit connected to the spar and uh, which is connected to the heavy plates at the bottom and um, the movement of the sea will move that floater. Uh, as the sea gets stronger, that floater moves horizontally upwards uh, and the, the magnetic coil gets charged by, by the waves. And as it uh, goes up, the magnetic field is broken and the charge is, is, uh, is uh, the alternating current is produced. So uh, it'll go back to shore, it uh, gets stepped down to 110 or 240 volts. Uh, if you click on uh, the next image, should show uh, the actual mm -hmm. production unit. Yeah, so that's the actual production unit. Uh, oh, so wow. in a country that's relied on very expensive diesel oil as the um, power for our very old uh, generators. Uh, this is a, a life-changing technology. How many how many um, megawatts does that generate? Just out of curiosity. Uh, my understanding is that uh, a array of six of those, I think they come in arrays of six or 12. If you see the first uh, uh, picture, um, uh, the underwater part is the base station and those cables, one set of cables goes to shore, one set of cables goes to another unit. So an array of six, uh, I, I have to double check that for you, I'm told an array of six or an array of 12, I, I can't, exactly pin which uh, right now uh, will produce one megawatt which is uh, enough is, is enough for our entire country to be honest uh, uh, but will uh, be more than enough for the mining operation uh, and to, to power our entire island this is fantastic yeah that's so, that's incredible man that's 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 really yeah. really really cool bitcoin mining to the last mile man <laughs> exactly man um 
someone tweeted uh, in the thread uh, with uh, that photo. Uh, it says, uh, Bukele, I'll see your volcanic geothermal uh, mine and I'll raise you the motion of the ocean. So, <laughs> which was kind of funny. But for a country, uh, especially my island, my island does not have uh, full-scale municipal electricity across the whole island. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, to go from... Diesel, uh, Lord, uh, yes, diesel. Okay. Yeah. Diesel. The, our, 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 uh, our Jurassic generators, which are all our country could afford, uh, are diesel-powered generators. And diesel fuel is, is fairly expensive, uh, which has to be shipped to us. So we pay the, the uh, BP and Shell, hit us with the cost of that transport. And then they park offshore and feed that down a pipeline uh, to storage units uh, on our main island. Uh, and then that, uh, those stores are... Uh, uh, divvied out into uh, smaller uh, vessels, ferries, who then take them to the outer islands. That's so it's a very inefficient and ex expensive and uh, anachronistic system that really serves no one except uh, the provider of the diesel fuel and uh, the generator of the electricity, of course, offloads that cost on the consumer. So I assume more countries is going to follow. I mean, any any country or island who is, you know, which is located <laughs> in, uh, you know, surrounded by oceanic waves and you know, exactly. harness that power. And there's a unit that they're modifying to be able to be used in countries just that have rivers. Just the movement of the river uh, uh, downstream can be harnessed by the unit and turned into electricity. So, yeah, it's a life-changing technology for people. Uh, and for archipelago countries like ours, which are a lot of small islands distributed over a large uh, patch of ocean, um, the ocean is our, our largest resource. It, it makes up uh, three quarters of our, our EEZ our exclusive economic zone that's the line drawn around our country and uh and constitutes our economic borders uh what's inside there are 153 pretty small islands uh with 700,000 square kilometers of waves so those waves could be put to use this is this is mind-boggling wow i mean this makes me even more excited and bullish <laughs> Oh, Lord, so exactly, man. Same here, same here. So, um, yeah, I mean, before we wrap up, um, guys, uh, what what do you think gonna happen in the? Which countries do you think uh, you know gonna you know go into the footsteps of El Salvador, go full you know full blown uh, whatever legal tender hyper Bitcoinization <laughs> and replicate the same thing? I heard it. Uh, was... Sorry, go ahead, brother. Yeah, so I heard from a very reliable source, um, Pan Paraguay and Panama right now. That's yeah, what it's that's, like. that's my too as well. Yeah, I, I mean, what I can add to that is um, I agree with the Lord in the sense that it will happen much faster than what much, uh, much of us expected. I myself included in that because, you know, Having stayed in Venezuela during the period in 2017 when hyperinflation broke up in the country, 2019, the electric grid fail, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada. I was one of those few patriots from my country that decided to stay within the country to see how things would have evolved, right? Just to, just to grasp a little bit better my whole reality and my personal story. Uh, right, but I bring this to the table because I mean the Venezuelan regime was sanctioned in 2017 by the U.S. and so uh, the state oil company as well, right? 
And so effectively they became, they were unable, right, to pay back for the debt of the country because no bank wants to work with you because the IMF and the World Bank and the US are behind you. Um, yeah. So you don't, you don't have means of, you don't have ways of payments. You can actually uh, store, store money, you can make international payments. So you'd have to revert somehow to another method of payment. And so the Venezuelan government had already been exploring with Bitcoin mining since, I, and I can say this first, wow. time, since 2013, man, because at first it was this thing that they just, they just wanted to know about that was happening within the country, right? Like, what are these bunch of geeks doing? What is this, what, what is this increase in electrical bills in this few zones and et cetera? But, but eventually right. it became part of the solution for them to start transacting money in and outside of the country, right? Right, without using the traditional banking and, and financial sector. Well, still using it, but using intermediaries in the middle between the traditional banking system and cryptocurrencies. So, so the thing is that since 2017, they've been trying to build up uh, cryptocurrency regulations in Venezuela, but they've all the, the, every every one every single one of those efforts has been tied up to this El Petro national cryptocurrency. And, when, and, what's, and what has been the end result of, of that after four years? Nothing, man. There's nothing. It's, it's just air. So it's, it's sad to say that Venezuela will actually be, I believe, one of the last countries in Latin America to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. But just because it is completely opposed, uh, it is a completely opposed philosophy uh, from the philosophy that the Venezuelan regime has. But 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 this is like bit, a, a government's adopting Bitcoin at legal tender equals open politics, Damn, right? Dude. For the I, I believe that for the first time, or or at least in a long time in human history, uh a, an entrepreneur from Minnesota that is right now living in the EU is being able to connect to a Bitcoin show host that lives right next to me and a politician that is open-minded from the other side of the world. And I would have loved that thing to have happened within my country for the past 20 right. years of my life. But because of stupidity and the, uh, the, uh, the crave for power, that human that we, we humans can sometimes have, you you, yep. just, you just end up destroying everything that you come by in the middle as as, as you just walk. You Man, walk. socialism right. and communism has destroyed uh, countries for over a hundred years now, and Venezuela was one of them. So. Yeah. So so th so this is this is the thing. Like uh, uh, yeah, I guess that I agree that that that. The Panama, because I do have sources in Panama as well. Uh, Panama will be one of those first countries. Paraguay potentially as well. Uh, there's there's miners from Brazil that when they want to mine, they're unable to mine in Brazil because the elect electric costs are so high that they just go to Paraguay. So there has already been a tendency for Bitcoin mining in Paraguay as well. Uh, in the end, man, look, a thousand small countries will be more, 50 and a and hundred more con uh, small countries will be more rele relevant and unstoppable than one big, one big nation yeah. that says no to this thing, man. And so if they, and like and by that time, even if they say no, they would have already been left apart, right? Like everybody yeah. would have already been Bitcoinized and they would be like, Dude, we want to join this party, but we need Bitcoin to join this party. What the fuck are we going to do? Are we, are we going to buy the ticket or exactly. not? Man? Because I'm getting tired of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. You stuck outside and the bouncer won't let you in past the velvet rope. <laughs> right? Right? Exactly. <laughs> well, Nico, um, yeah, yes. what do you think is coming up? Look, um, there's going to be a... there's. A great awakening, but I am, and look, I make daily uh, Bitcoin content, um, and the writing's on the wall. There's going to be a clash. It's going to be rough. There's going to be casualties, um, but as long as you hold 
uh, everything's gonna be fine. But I, 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 these people, these people are not gonna go gently into that good night. Okay. And right now, Bitcoin sitting, you know, at less than a trillion dollar market cap, eh, they could ignore it, right? But when Bitcoin starts getting close to 10 trillion, the market cap of gold, and then when it starts surpassing that, when it starts actually becoming an actual threat, yeah. Um, I I don't want to say I'm scared because like we are ready, but I am. And look, I've talked I've I've spoken to other content creators as well about this subject. I've, I've spoken to Odell. I've spoken to um, Ben from BTC Sessions, and man, it's it's coming. It's coming. It's you, you've seen. Look, I'll put it to you this way. Okay, this isn't very conspiracy theory or anything. Look at how much they've censored anything that goes against the 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 COVID narrative. Yeah, anything. Like, look at how much they've gone after that. Now imagine. Yeah. When then when there's a there's a there's a there's a system of money outside of the control that starts actually being a threat to their power. Yeah. Do you get what I'm trying to tell you? Like yeah. that's what we're gonna be up against. Bitcoin will win. The internet has always won. But what I'm I'm worried about, right, is what casualties, how many people are going to sell because they get scared because, yeah. you know, a central bank st yeah, releases yeah. a statement. Right. Yeah, so man, you can only hold all through knowledge. Yeah. So right. so that so I'm excited. <clears throat> Because freedom is coming. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. And and after this conversation with the Lord, oh my God. I'm like, it's confirming everything that I've heard from other countries as well. Mm -hmm. Right? So it makes me incredibly bullish, incredibly hopeful for the future. That's what Bitcoin does. Right? But at the same time, we have this final boss. Okay? And man right. you have no idea this thing is gonna it's gonna be a hammer it's gonna just come savagely and they're just gonna label man i wouldn't be surprised if you start hearing things like if you own bitcoin you're an enemy of the state like mm -hmm. along those lines mm -hmm. right and i'm not talking about like china and i'm not talking about uh, uh countries that are not democracies i'm talking about in democratic countries yeah right that have benefited the most from the legacy system. The rhetoric coming out of the mainstream media is going to be surreal, in my opinion. And look at the Let's EPP. I mean, it's the same words, you know, they're using. It's that's why they're pushing so so vehemently, you know, for these cool. CBDCs. You know, they, they, they they're going to push the climate narrative. That's what they're going to use to try to control Bitcoin. The ESG narrative. Yeah. The yeah. the it just consumes too much energy. You yeah. see that they already tapped Elon on the shoulder. Okay, it's not normal that one of the smartest guys in the world goes from yeah, Bitcoin's awesome, and then he does a 180. He got tapped. Okay, that's essentially what happened. He got tapped by some very powerful people. Okay, and. They're going to go after Bitcoin because of the energy consumption, okay? Because that's what they use to control. Uh, I think I lost video, but I still have audio. Yeah, that's, hear, what they, yeah. that's what they use to control. But um, essentially what they're going to do is that they're going to try to push a proof of stake coin. So like an Ethereum or whatever, because they can coerce that coin. They can coerce a proof of stake system, but they cannot coerce Bitcoin. They cannot coerce yeah. a proof of work system. Yeah, right? that's so, a sly roundabout way to which Austrian economist Hayek, you know, I mean, bless him, <laughs> which the, the, he could have, maybe he couldn't even imagine, you know, that we could ever have like an open monitor network is totally decentralized and censorship resistant. I mean, it's it's over. The game is over. Pandora's box open, you know, 12 or 13 years ago. That's right. Yeah, I, I had thought, um, to be honest, before El Salvador, uh, most of us had thought Venezuela would be the first country yeah. uh, to adopt uh, because the, their level of usage is higher, had been higher yeah, man. Uh, of the base layer than anyone else. Yeah. Look, what, what I can say, and I can, I can disclose this because I no longer live in the country. I'm finally safe. I'm finally able to like walk to the supermarket like a normal person, right? Um, like I tried talking to the regulators in Venezuela for so long, man, right? And, uh, it's, it's just 
you know, like every time I was like, dude, just legalize Bitcoin. We, we don't need anything else, like just Bitcoin. They would say like, oh no, but that will be anarchism. And inside of me, I would be like, how the fuck does a <laughs> communist come and tell you? <laughs> but, 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 but right, but that's, but that's the thing. I tried pushing so hard for building our own infrastructure of building of Bitcoin full nodes. Randy Brito tried pushing so hard for building our own offline censorship resistant network to like a money censorship resistant money transmission layer within the country that could work as an on ramp and, and as an and as an off ramp etc but what can i say man uh, uh, history, history is actually going to for, force them again and be yeah. be have they would have been early uh, early adopters they they ended up not being just because of crave for power and eventually yes. the fight for freedom will kneel them down man of course i, yeah. I agree i agree that eventually venezuela will declare bitcoin as legal tender because the nation currently needs needs it man i mean they're unable to move the money and it's the and it's the country with the biggest oil reserves in the world so sure. So there is money. So there is money. There's still like money in Venezuela, but they just they just can't dematerialize it into an or materialize it into another form of of payment, right? So if Brazil gets on board with this, if Paraguay gets on board, if El Salvador gets on board, if Panama, which is one of the main banking systems that the Venezuela government used to use at its time to funnel money internationally accepts bitcoin as legal tender then in venezuela will say okay you know what we have been on this fight alone against the imf and the world bank and all of the sudden we have all of these dudes that are not part of our team but that if we if we join the bitcoin team then maybe we have other pawns to fight next to yeah that's against. a game theory in full force that's the game theory, i think that's yeah. it, man. So and to anyway, be honest and anyway, it, anyway, yeah. however it, it plays out either to sooner or later venezuela will be on board for bitcoin legal tender man i'm so sure yeah, yeah. i'm just hoping it's it's going to happen not necessarily in synchronicity like simultaneously that's impossible it's you know it's just impossible but i'm hoping for shortest intervals time intervals you know for the execution and because that's why i asked you know lord what do you think you know is, is time of the essence and i think this is the momentum we have to seize right now you know yeah guys i guess we get, i'm sorry yeah i get, uh, just one one quick on uh, a note here. I, just, I, ju I just guess that we've been through the technophile bubble side of bitcoin the retail bubble side of bitcoin now we're still at mid cycles in the institutional wave on Bitcoin. And so I guess that we can expect, it wouldn't be like too crazy to expect it right now for the next halving, like a government fuel bubble in Bitcoin, right? Like debt uh. markets and traditional monetary markets diving into Bitcoin, like not only savings and cash, getting cash savings from treasury accounts of, of companies, but foreign reserves, man, and debt and fucking debt converting into Bitcoin. And it's just, it's, it's just this slow but constant process of Bitcoin connecting and intertwining all, all of different forms of money and markets that exist, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my understanding is Paraguay, Panama as well. Uh, I've gotten uh, reliable reports that Colombia is not going to be too far behind. Um, I think, as you said, I think Brazil uh, with El Salvador and also I think, yeah, exactly, you'll know better, but it would seem Venezuela would have no logical reason to hold out anymore. Um, with all the surrounding countries, Panama's the banking system it, it's previously used, uh, it trades with all these surrounding countries, it would seem that it would make Venezuela will eventually capitulate. 
so, yeah, extremely bullish on Central and South America and uh, the courageousness of uh, President Bukele and hopefully even more leaders um, uh, in Africa. Uh, Nigeria uh, uh, was similar to Venezuela in its, its journey with Bitcoin uh, being slightly ahead of the rest of the pack. And hopefully now in, in the Pacific, uh, the premier economic think tank uh, in New Zealand uh, called the lobby, wrote to their, their prime minister a week ago, urging her to, uh, for the government to accept Bitcoin as foreign currency. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a very uh, clever sort of backdoor way into getting adoption as legal tender. Uh, because uh, if it's classified as foreign currency, then immediately it's declassified as an asset and you no longer have to pay capital gains tax on it. So uh, New Zealand could be headed that way. Um, not could be. New Zealand is Bitcoin friendly. It, uh, its national pension fund uh, run by the government uh, last year uh, bought... Uh, 5% exposure to Bitcoin. Uh, so there's definitely moves in New Zealand and hopefully now us uh, in the South Pacific, uh, I'll be pushing for it. There's, um, as I said, the plan is uh, exposure to the Bitcoin network, which requires no legislative change or, uh, uh, or any amendment in how the Reserve Bank treats it. It's merely... Uh, adding uh, one app to every user's phone and adding one app to the point of sale and that automatically exposes us. Then I've been fortunate enough uh, for the team in El Salvador to have given me the bill uh, early so that I could begin working on our version of it. Uh, our version of it uh, requires what's called a gap analysis which the Attorney General's office would usually do and take three months. Uh, I finished half of it last week and hopefully we'll have the other half finished this week uh, where we check the bill against all our, our constitution and our existing legislation uh, to ensure there are no uh, contradictions. Uh, and then uh, in a House of 26 members, uh, 14 is a majority. Uh, the Lords make up nine votes, and we always vote in a block. We, we we never break ranks. So where one goes, we all go. So uh, my guys, uh, my other eight guys will go with me. That's nine. Uh, I have uh, three uh, good colleagues. Uh, are not good, not that anyone's bad, but uh, closer colleagues in the uh, people's representatives uh, who, through their own journeys uh, uh, with uh, technology, have uh, been exposed to Bitcoin and uh, will be uh, friendly to, the, to a proposed bill. And that makes 12 and only leaves two extra votes uh, to get 14. Uh, the mechanics of that requires going through a, a legislation committee and a whole house committee before uh, it being tabled as, as a, a bill. Uh, any pushback uh, by my good friend, the governor of the Reserve Bank, uh, <laughs> who I've spent many a, a night over a Macallan 25 bottle of single malt uh, discussing the future of the country's economy. Uh, he's a, a London School of Economics, uh, Keynesian economist. Uh, once I uh, explained to him how exposure to the technology will increase our GDP by 30% by putting 30% extra in people's pockets, meaning they'll spend 30% extra uh, of capital uh, injected into the economy. Uh, he'll see that uh, politically, uh, if I go on the front page of the newspaper and say, I want you to receive $30 instead of 70 a week, and this guy is telling me that you can't, then he, he will fall into line uh, most definitely. 
which only leaves His Majesty the King, uh, whose signature is required to, for a bill to be brought into law. And uh, that will require me to do uh, what I've done uh, since the inception of my political career, uh, which is to seek an audience with His Majesty and brief him completely on the pros and cons of every issue uh, and put him in uh, the most informed position uh, to make a decision. Uh, so those are the mechanics and logistics of getting us off the ground in Tonga. Um, the, the mining will be dependent on uh, me getting my head around the technology that these very generous companies have offered as soon as possible and making a decision. So, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of our, our, our inside of the world, uh, what's kind of going on. Um, I don't know what may be of interest to you guys, maybe, maybe not, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, a country called Tuvalu, who's uh, about two countries down from ours, two islands down from ours. It's, it's uh, one of the smallest countries in the world, if I'm not. The one of the smallest. Um, our country could fit in uh, the Astrodome. Their country could fit probably in, yeah, Candlestick Park. Uh, they, <laughs> yeah, they're going completely paperless. Um, they're adopting uh, a public ledger where they'll put their entire judiciary, executive and legislature uh, on a, a public ledger uh, with using blockchain, obviously, uh, to be as transparent as possible. Uh, and they are going to adopt uh, the, the head of the projects, a guy named George Siossi, and I'm still trying to convince him to adopt Bitcoin, unfortunately, they uh yeah they're going down the bsv route uh mm. but yeah yeah i yeah i'm i'm still i'm still working on him. <laughs> you gotta you gotta save them you gotta save them i gotta save i've gotta save the whole country from that yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah, my yeah god uh, Lord, yeah. Lord, i have a i have i'm sorry nico no no, uh, no dude, go ahead Lord, i have a quick question for you so are you absolutely guys brother go ahead are you guys able to like draft a, a, a law to make Bitcoin legal tender in Tonga? Is it like a similar process to the one that you just explained or yeah, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so uh, as I said, I, I, I was very fortunate to get a copy early from the El Salvadorian team, their bill. And that bill is, is, is quite a, a, a blueprint. So what I've been doing Usually new legislation in Tonga, you send it to the Attorney General's office and they spend three months going through all Tonga's existing legislation, especially the constitution, to make sure the new bill doesn't contradict any of it. Uh, so what usually would take three months, I've done a week and finished half of it. I'll finish the other half this week and have a bill that's ready to present to parliament right now. The problem is, our borders in Tonga have been locked, uh, hard locked down since March 2020. Um, our Prime Minister had set to open them in September until Fiji, who is right next to us, and Papua New Guinea, who are next to us, uh, began getting 100 new cases of COVID each week. Uh, and it sort of scared our, our Minister of Health and our Cabinet uh, our health system will not handle a COVID outbreak, even a mild one. And our country and Samoa are the two most obese nations on the planet, according to the WHO. Our major killer uh, are NCDs, non-communicable diseases, which means we have a high rate of cardiovascular disease, lung disease, uh, diabetes, uh, lifestyle diseases, and these are all the major risk factors for COVID. Uh, so no Prime Minister wants to be the one on watch that lets the country be wiped out when COVID comes in. So he's hard locked it. And that, that's why we're still on the list. There's us, Palau, Tuvalu, 
uh, North Korea and Turkmenistan are the only uh, six countries that are still zero COVID mm. uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's because of the hard rock border. Um, and people are complaining. They're writing in, in the newspapers because not only do we have uh, a hard lock border, but we now have a curfew. At 11 p.m. every night, the army can, will come out onto the streets and make sure everyone goes home. Uh, and uh, there's a curfew from 11 p.m. till uh, sunrise. So people are writing in saying, uh, why do we have a curfew if our borders are already locked? But our Prime Minister is also an evangelical pastor and his position is nothing good happens between 11pm and 6am in the morning, so you should all stay at home. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, hopefully I'll be able to get in earlier because I'd really like to present the bill in this year's sitting of Parliament. Um, the only... Uh, Flights in and out have been, uh, when COVID hit, uh, Australian New Zealand's orchards, fruit orchards, uh, Australians and New Zealanders, just like in the US, will not pick fruit. So it's usually uh, unskilled labour from overseas. And traditionally, it's uh, backpackers from Europe come through and they pick the fruit and they go on their holiday. Uh, but through COVID, no backpackers. So Australia and New Zealand did a deal with Tonga, Samoa and Vanuatu in the Pacific to fly thousands of Pacific Islanders over to pick the fruit uh, and then get repatriated. They go in three-month slots. So every three months, there's a repatriation flight from Australia and New Zealand taking our fruit pickers back. So that's the only likely way in uh, or has been for most people for the past year is to hop one of those flights. Uh, you have to get di per permission from the Minister of Health. Every single person who hop who is on a flight must get individual uh, sign off from our Minister of Health. So it's it's a little bit convoluted, but it's not impossible. So. Um, as I've discussed, all those things I can do remotely, my discussions with the Prime Minister and the rest of the Cabinet, uh, with my fellow Lords in Parliament, uh, all that can be done remotely from here in New Zealand. But presenting the bill has to be in person. And, uh, yeah, you don't brief His Majesty over a Zoom call. That has to be done in person also. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I'm, I'm very convinced, uh, Lord. You know, uh, first of all, I want to, you know, wish you the best uh, after your post-surgery. I hope you, you know, you're going to Thank you, brother. heal yourself. Uh, I think Thank the intention you. is very important here. And <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm convinced, you know, you, you will do whatever it takes to, you know, make the decision makers uh, and the, his, his majesty, you know, comprehend <laughs> what's here, yes. what's here really at stake, you know. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a, the... The freedom and livelihood of our our people, particularly our people uh, who need it most, that is at stake. And I think when they see that, there is no uh, person uh, with a conscience that could possibly deny uh, that to a population. Exactly. Uh, that's my view, anyway. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Thank you so much. It was really I had a blast. Um, uh, I'm going to you know you. edit. Sorry for the glitch. I even changed my location to have super bandwidth, but all of a sudden I had you know lost connection. I don't. No know. problem. No problem. I'm. I thank you. I'm extremely privileged to be here with these two uh, extremely well informed and uh, generous gentlemen. And with yourself, uh, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and I thank you for including me. Um, and I hope this is the first of many chats. Yeah, definitely. We'll have to repeat this. So, Lord, thank you so much, Alessandro, Nico. Hope we'll have a great day. <laughs> Bye. Awesome. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you, Kevin. Thank you, brother. Bye. Bye. So, guys, how'd you guys like this? Didn't you love this epic talk? 
I really had a blast. I had to re-listen. I definitely have to re-listen to this whole interview talk because I had a technical glitch, unfortunately. So, but I can glue this together, definitely, you know, for the total, uh, you know, version of it. So, um, yeah, let me know what you think. Um, it was not only highly educational, but you know, very elevating, very, you know, hopeful. Gives me a lot of hope. Gives me a lot of optimism. A lot of perspective at the end. Gives me the light. You know, it shows me a little light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, yeah, we are really the cat is out the bag. Pandora's box open. The genie's out the bottle. And uh, we are, you know, going. It's it's not going to be frictionless. Uh, you know, I always knew that. And honeymoon phase of Bitcoin is over. Uh, but this is, you know, a totally unique, uh, uh, extraordinary, uh, you know, moment in human history, human evolution, monetary evolution, in the, in, in our quest, in our path, on our path of uh, freedom seeking. So, yeah, I really had a pleasure and honor to sit down with Lord Fisitura and Alexander Cesare and Nico. And uh, let me know what you think. Give me your suggestions. Uh, or any other suggestions for future talks, panel discussions, and hope you really enjoyed this. And please share uh, and write a five-star review on Apple Pod Podcasts, iTunes. Follow me and my guests on, on Twitter, and my DMs are open. My email address is hello. Uh, I'm sorry, my email address is kd at kvandamani.com. So uh, thank you so much again. And I'll see you soon. Bye.